everyone. So I'm really excited because um, I write about mobile technology and mobile has changed the way we do a ton of things from how we work to how we uh, don't talk to each other at dinner, all of these things. One of the areas that's been slower despite a lot of investment is mobile commerce. And I always wonder what, what's so hard about it. And so since I don't have any of the answers, I'm very excited that I'm about to bring on four people that do have some of the answers. So please help me welcome Christian Von Hamel. Bonten, Executive Vice President of Wirecard, Mark Alexander Christ, co-founder of SumUp, Holger Spielberg, Head of Mobile Payments for PayPal Deutschland, and Peter Vesco, Senior VP of Business Unit Payment Unit for Deutsche Telekom and CEO of Click and Buy. So, gentlemen. As I mentioned uh, before you guys came out, I was you know, saying that you know, the phones and mobile have really changed every aspect of how we work and live. Um, and I know for your world, um, payments has really changed a lot. For most of us, the world of payments hasn't changed nearly as much as we like. Uh, we still, you know, we use our smartphone for everything and then when we go to pay, many of us still pull out our wallet. So I'm interested to hear the experiences you've had and where we're going. And I want to get to where we're going, but I think what might be helpful by way of introduction is if everyone just shared a little bit about your experiences with mobile commerce and a couple things that you've learned about what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, if you want to start. Hi, my name is Mark Christ. I'm one of the co-founders of SumUp. We set out in 2011 to revolutionize the local point of sale. And in 2011, there wasn't nearly anybody in that market except maybe one American player and some guys from Sweden. Um, but what we want to do is really to offer small merchants the tools that a large corporation has these days. Because most of those guys still do most of their business in pen and paper. So we were thinking, do we build cash register, a loyalty solution, a reservation system, some deal platform? Um, but we really settled on payment, as we thought that's the biggest pain point that merchants have those days. So what we did is we developed a small card reader that's very inexpensive and built a whole card acceptance solution around that. So in, in that, we are basically setting out to disrupt three different industries. One is the really the terminal business, which is, are these large, bulky, classical, very expensive, not so beautiful terminals. Um, and there we basically developed our own solutions. Second is the acquiring business. We have our own payment institution license from the um, FCA in the UK, which allows us to onboard merchants easily and really do the whole payment flow of them, uh, for them. Everything that seems cumbersome and difficult to the merchants, we want to take away so it's as easy as to sign up on Facebook and just accept payments within two minutes after signing up. And the third one is really the cash register system, where basically we offer our merchants a uh, very, very simple cash register system. And by disrupting these three industries, we didn't even start with mobile payments, because mobile payments means you take your phone and you connect it to the cash register and you pay with that. And I don't see the German market being there yet, but we are very, very well positioned in the acceptance network we built so far to launch uh, mobile payment solutions based on that network. So coming at it really from the merchant side, Peter, what, what have you guys learned about what works and what doesn't work uh, as far as payments and commerce uh, digitally? Well, first of all, obviously mobile commerce, mobile payment will be a very attractive and huge market for the future. So this is for sure. So we believe that to enter into this market, we need to address the two-party model. That means consumers as well as merchants. So finally launched in Poland. It was a success. We are going forward in the U.S. with ISIS. Um, the challenge for this industry is to find the right partners. So to create a new industry, you need to have strong parties to invest in the future. It's a business case for five to seven years that we get the return of investment. And none of the big players non Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom, maybe even not PayPal, could create this huge new market. So finally, one challenge is to find this partner strategy between banks, incumbents, 
and telcos, and this is what we are working for. And is it more of a challenge to find people that are willing to do it, or more of a challenge to find how to divide the pie? I mean, it seems like, at least in the U.S., one of the biggest hurdles to mobile payments has been the fact that right now there's certain players that are very well compensated for their role in the value chain, and a bunch of players, uh, such as the telecom providers, that would like to be compensated for their part in the value chain, and, you know, I think we've sort of maxed out at how much of a transaction dollar can go to payment processing. We've actually seen that. That decline. So I guess my question is, is it too few partners or is it the fact that everyone wants a significant piece of a pie? So from my perspective, this market is highly fragmented. This is one of the challenges in the payment, but also upcoming commerce industry. So finding some parties who partner and to divide the pie in the right way would be a disruptive move for the future. And you answered your question by giving the question. Yeah. Um, currently, we are working on creating the value chain, who's doing what, but I'm very positive that within the next 12 to 18 months, there will be some significant partnerships within Europe. Okay. Um, Christian, what, again, what, what have you guys figured out in the time that you've been in this space? What, what's working, what's not? Um, yeah, to explain this, um, maybe just a short introduction. Wirecard is a company which is simply focusing on payment um, and uh, payment across all the different channels. Um, and mobile commerce for us is simply the driver of mobile payment. Um, if you don't have commerce, you don't have payment. Um, payment is uh, not something you want to do, it's something you usually have to do. Um, so what we see is that uh, mobile commerce, um, and there have been uh, F-commerce for Facebook commerce, so there have been always different terms around commerce. And all the new channels, of course, are interesting opportunities for every retailer. Um, what we see is it's not like um, simply what you can do is taking payments from one channel and apply it to the other channel. Um, because payment is something which needs to fit into the processes of the new channel. Uh, and we all know that the checkout process at a at a till um, in the store is different from an online checkout. So the requirements on payments are different ones, and we as a supplier need to make sure it fits. Um, and this means for mobile commerce, we need to understand the users and the various different business models the merchants have. Make it easy, easy to understand for the user, easy to use, um, and also see what, how the processes will change across the time. Um, because just taking a checkout from an laptop browser onto a mobile browser is not what the industry has seen is something which will be successful. You mentioned that it's really hard to go from one area of payments to another, which kind of brings me to Holger because, you know, PayPal uh, sort of built itself up as a way to pay for things online. First, primarily as a way to pay for auctions and other things on eBay, and then, you know, pretty, pretty strongly as a way to pay an alternative means of payment for a lot of online transactions. What, what I'm not sure everyone even knows is that PayPal has been working over the last couple of years to uh, expand that into physical commerce, into uh, in-person transactions and mobile transactions. How has that transition gone and what, it, what have you guys learned? Uh, we, we're learning every day, actually, and I think learning is like, one of the most critical things uh, to do in payment. You have to understand what users are doing, what, what, what the merchants actually are doing, and then adapt to that. But coming back to, to, uh, to, to PayPal, yes, I think in 2011, uh, the company uh, very c clearly and quickly decided to focus on, on mobile uh, because we saw the trend really, uh, or the shift in, in, in user behavior. And how and much of that shift, just to cut you off, how much of that shift was predicated on what uh, Peter and I were talking about, the fact that there was so much fighting over the pie that the existing players weren't actually making much progress? Uh, well, it's, it's two things, right? It's, it's, we have to distinguish between mobile payment where you use the phone as, a, as the payment uh, tool, if you will, and uh, payment through mobile devices. And um, what, we, what we've seen over the last two and a half years, we now have between 25 to more than 30% of all transactions now comes from mobile devices, our transactions. So a third of to a fourth, Germany is a little behind, it's just shy, shy of 20%. Um, of all transactions goes from mobile devices. But, but, but that, includes, that includes me paying for my eBay auction on my phone that's rather correct. than my computer. And then frankly, that actually is, is a lot of uh, payments on tablets on the couch. So mm -hmm. couch commerce is a big piece. So the mobile piece is not so much the critical uh, factor, but 
what is the critical factor is that these mobile devices are context aware. And that makes them so interesting from a commerce point of view uh, because you can create or you can use them in a specific context. And one of the difficulties we all, I think, facing is, and we all learning, is that payment is not payment. Um, not comparing online to the, to the real physical world, but also comparing a grocery shop to a boutique. It's very, very different. As of today, the infrastructure is basically the same. Um, and has been for a number of years. And, and one of the things I learned uh, very recently, which I found interesting because I'm, I'm just at age, that um, the transition or the change we currently see in retail is only comparable to um, uh, uh, starting self-serving uh, grocery stores. Uh, when, the, when pricing uh, was freed up uh, from regulatory issues, and basically the, the uh, merchants decided that now the consumer actually can pick their own uh, uh, you know, basket and, and, and move out. And that was 40 years ago. It was end, end of 60s, beginning of, uh, of the 70s. And now we see a similar transition of retail because all, all of this, what we call internet technology or online technology, the, the, the very powerful tools are now applicable um, to retail, plus the the user already changed behavior. You know, you have a, a, a very knowledgeable user today or, or consumer uh, who knows prices, who has compared products, and and comes prepared basically shopping if he comes actually in the store or he chooses basically uh, to use online uh, notions. So again, circling back to what PayPal is doing, we come from the online world. Uh, we're we, 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 we feel we are a leading company globally uh, in terms of um, uh, payments for mobile devices, and uh, the next step is really transitioning in the physical world, which is happening as of today, where we are piloting, and I believe 2014 for all of us will be critical years to, um, to see certain pilots really move into the first scale, scalable approaches. In the United States, one of the writers for Wired uh, did this experiment where she went a month without her wallet um, and used only her phone as both identity and uh, payment mechanism. Um, and I was struck not so much by what she was and wasn't able to do uh, a year ago when she did this, but I'm struck by each month seeing something that was hard a year ago that's easier today. And I know Germany and Europe uh, and everywhere really vary in terms of how practical this is. I think a writer, uh, we were discussing this backstage, and a writer did a similar thing in Germany and the UK. But, you know, what... What are the real hard parts about getting to that reality? I mean, we know that more of us want to have our phones than our wallets. Why is it hard to just have our phone as a payment mechanism? Um, I think it's, uh, it, it's varying across Europe. Um, but one of the challenges, of course, is we have it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, so uh, if you look at the payment culture across Europe, it's different. If you look at the UK, um, they are used to using already contactless technology multiple times per day. Um, Transport for London will switch uh, to Visa and MasterCard contactless technology. So you just tap your card or your mobile device uh, for your travel journey. If you look on the other side of Germany, we are a cash-oriented society. Um, so it's simply a different history we have with cash. Um, so what we need to ensure, and this is probably where some of us, of course, also helping, getting more acceptance locations out where you can use your card, where you can use your mobile device. So at the end, at the, we need to create both at the same time. We need, of course, to make the product attractive for the users to take them up, and on the other side, ensure that they can use the product. And one of the, the things that I've heard, um, and we were discussing this backstage, is sometimes this gets framed as, you know, the phone has to be quicker or, you know, a quicker way of paying or easier. Um, and it, it strikes me that in, in some locations that may be relevant. We were talking about, you know, in the grocery store, that might be the most relevant thing. But, but probably the phone's going to lose if that's the only metric we base it on. But doesn't having something with as much knowledge, as much context, as you mentioned, Holger, um, really present ways of delivering loyalty, of delivering communications? It would seem to me that that's where the benefit is. And I know that's kind of where your business is based, is you know, replacing these three disparate technologies that were all necessary. You need a cash register. You need a payment mechanism. But it's not just about replacing those with a different computer. It's about doing something better. What are some of the better things that each of you have seen, either from your own company or just seeing around? What are some of the better things that mobile commerce is delivering? 
Go, go ahead, Peter, and then Mark. Payment is a commodity, honestly speaking. So today I can pay easily with my plastic card. So no value add by paying with the mobile. That means for the consumer to use the mobile means you need to be a technology freak. Hey, it's a small niche. Or you need to provide value add. Value add means really to save with your phone, to get vouchers, coupons, to get relevant information. And this is what we're working on. So from our perspective, payment is only a fundament. It's not too sexy. But shopping with the right offers, uh, the support to find the right locations, it's attractive as well for the merchants who are getting more customers into their stores and it's attractive for the consumers. And this is how consumers' behavior will be changed in the future. Payment is only the fundament. And this is finally what we are working on, it's infrastructure, what you mentioned. And I'm, I'm quite sure that in 2015, in Germany, the NFC infrastructure will be ramped up, there will be iBeacon stores, whatever. So infrastructure will be not the problem. There will be wallets in the market from O2, Vodafone, Telekom, and so on. Infrastructure will be solved. But consumer behavior, this is the key challenge for the future. Mark, what are you seeing in terms of what of the services you're able to deliver by replacing that technology? What, what are the merchants really valuing of what you offer? I, I think it's really getting the merchants used to what they're doing here. I mean, we, we are even one step ahead of this. We have to get merchants used to accept credit cards. And that's fine if you have mer the customers coming in five times a day to pay by credit card. That's an easy process. But if you're a very small merchant and you only have like two credit card payments a month, you struggle to find your card reader, you don't remember the login for the, for the phone, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you really need to get the merchants to accept the whole process, and the end customer also to accept the, that process. And, and that's, that's just something that takes time. But that's kind of been the easiest sell in the digitization of commerce has been sort of to have a solution for those that never took anything other than cash. We've seen it in the U.S. with Square. It's just enabled a lot of things. But one of the interesting things is the consumer value that that delivers. For example, with Square in the U.S., and I don't know if it's the case with your system, you know, probably the single uh, biggest benefit I get out of paying by Square is I get that receipt by email, and I'm always a month behind on my expense reports at best. Um, and to know that it's in my email versus lost in my wallet is a huge benefit. Are, does your service today deliver some of those benefits? We do it exactly the same. You can get your receipt by email or SMS, and that's a nice benefit, and end customers like this. But do I go to a sum up merchant rather than a traditional terminal merchant to get my e receipt by email? Probably not. While wow, this is a great receipt. So I think, uh, as Peter mentioned, loyalty is one big thing, discovery is another one. There's a lot in restaurants happening around pre-ordering um, and all those good things. So value, discounts, obviously those things are, are, are valued. What else, what else in this shift to mobile, what's really delivering value? And I hate jargony terms, yeah, but I think that really is what we're talking about. I think the critical things, and I think there's general agreement here, it's, it's actually about, it's about use cases, right? It, it has to make sense in whatever context or use case you as a user or, or as a customer are in. If, if you look at the things which are working or which are also publicly known, like for instance, Starbucks, right? Um, I think after PayPal, one of the, the, the second largest, the most number of mobile transactions, it was not about payment. It, for them, it's a, it's a loyalty, it's a brand notion and, and pre-order and, 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 and the convenience factor. And, and it works very well. It's a very narrow field, but it works very well. And uh, you will see other things coming up. Uh, uh, you, you see uh, my taxi works because it was a new, new, new use case um, of mobility for you know receipts, the whole th exactly what, what you discussed. These are the things we have to look for and and create and demonstrate that there is value, and then give people the chance to change their behavior. And um, and again, one of the things we've been learning over the last year or so is, is really it, 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 not that we didn't know it before, it will take time. You have to give people space and time to try things out. And um, it, um, as more of these snippets and different use cases we will see, either in transport or in ordering your coffee or in the, in the store, then you will actually kind of see a picture evolving where I, I guess all of us will actually play a role in. Well, I want to definitely leave plenty of time for audience questions, so if you haven't already thought of one, please uh, 
please definitely think we have a lot of experience on this stage in, in a growing field. So definitely, uh, in a minute or two, I'm going to ask for your guys' questions. But um, I have to ask, you know, this Bitcoin question. I've been a real laggard, and, you know, I, I try not to figure things out until I have to. But I'd hit the point where I was like, okay, I have to figure out what this thing is and what it's all about. I'm curious, what do each of you think about the notion of currency becoming digital, currency transcending national uh, borders, and is it something you see as, like me, you know, it's reached the point you have to know about it, but it doesn't yet affect your business, or are you guys actively looking at how do I incorporate Bitcoin into what I do? And I'm guessing if your merchants are barely taking credit cards for the first time, you're probably not trying to sell them on Bitcoin. But for some of the other folks, or even for you if you are, um, you know, what do you, what do you take away from this uh, Bitcoin experiment that we're all in. And what, what we are seeing, obviously, we have a lot of the innovative merchants more, and they're surrendered as, as, uh, 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 surrounded by end customers that actually are interested in Bitcoins. Okay. If you walk around the Berlin Kreuzberg neighborhood where our office is, there are like at least 10 outlets where you can already pay with Bitcoins. Wow. And those guys then say, well, I have this summer tablet here and I have this Bitcoin tablet here. Why can't we get so those together? It's definitely on the roadmap. It's not in a critical mass kind of way right. where you go like, should I inter introduce China Union Pay or Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> some of the discussions we're having. Um, but uh, one of our US competitors, Rebel, actually yeah. implemented Bitcoin yep. a couple of days ago, um, where basically you can pay at the Rebel cash register with the Bitcoin. And Peter? that's not unlikely for us Bitcoin. either. That end story will be regulated, will be death within six months. Regulated and taxed within six months. It, uh, at the country level, uh, do you think it'll be regulated differently in different countries? Well, or? In our key markets where I'm looking on, it means in Germany, Poland, in Eastern Europe, no chance from my perspective. Because the regulation will come maybe in 12 months, and then there is no advantage for things like this, and we are investing no time and money in Bitcoins. Excellent. Um, I think Bitcoin is quite interesting because what you see is you can create innovation and get it spread it around the world in a very short time frame. Um, but the question is, where is Bitcoin in the moment? It's something which is for tech freaks. Um, so it's not in somewhere in nearly into a mass market uh, because you need to understand the model, how it works. Um, and in the end, money is all about trust. And the question is, will people trust something which has no backing? because there is no backing um, in the moment. Um, or will you trust the euro? Also, it's also maybe not the best backing <laughs> in the moment. Um, but in the end, people will probably still stick with the euro. Um, so if you look on a time scale, there are still people in Germany which take their cash and put it under the bed. There are other people putting it on the bank. Um, and if I would look at 45 years ago, there might be more bitcoins in the market. Uh, but I agree in the end, I will believe it will be regulated um, because every financial service in the end gets <laughs> regulated uh, because in the end um, the government want to know where is money moving, how it is moving um, and uh, especially the US uh, with uh, all the uh, regulations around uh, fighting uh, terrorism yeah, and, it's and other regulations, they will of course put it into under a stronger regulation mm -hmm. and then the question is will it survive? Or will it be dead? Well, no one I'm, else. I'm curious for you guys, because you, you came in as the Bitcoin of the era. I mean, you came in <laughs> as the new way of paying for things. And eventually, PayPal, as some of you know, is actually a bank. Um, in order to provide the services that you wanted, you had to sort of go through the existing regulations. So I think you guys have learned. What do you make of Bitcoin? And, and well, I, have, I have three answers. Uh, uh, the first one is on PayPal. We are a regulated bank. That's why for us currently it's, it's not an issue. Um, uh, however, in an eBay context, we're looking at it very carefully uh, because it uh, you know, creates notions of international uh, payment, uh, which we have to look at and we are looking at. And as a, um, somebody who you know, spent most of the time in innovation and, and, and trying to new, new things, um, it, it warrants to look at it very carefully. And, and Mark said it already, is users are using it. You know, uh, one of the problems, uh, and, and, and uh, excuse me for pointing it out, but uh, for NFC is that nobody, it was about infrastructure, but nobody was using it. But here, mm -hmm. users are using it. We would be 
stupid to not look at it um, and and to see how we can create it while we have to observe obviously regulatory issues and you know make it as safe as possible uh, for everybody to use so it's, it's a very interesting notion uh, but as of today for PayPal it's not a, it's not a topic from an eBay point of view we're looking at it I'm not seeing any uh, Twitter questions but are there questions yet from the audience um, I think there are folks with microphones perhaps um, certainly raise your hands and stand up and I'm hoping I see people quickly coming with microphones so I saw one hand over here can you raise it again thank you there's someone with a microphone coming if you can say who you are and where you're from too. okay my name is Suleim Mapsley I'm coming from a country called Oman perhaps not many people know where this is but this is a, a country in the Middle East uh, my question is in two parts uh, one part is does the panelist uh, Seriously, seriously believe that there will be a time in this world that we will never ever have to carry cash with us even to do the simple things like giving a tip okay and the other question or the other part of this question is um, do they believe that current technologies or the evolution of the current technologies enough to achieve uh, you know this vision or it will take a completely different technology in order to achieve it? Two Thank really, you. two really good questions. Let's start with the first one there. Could you repeat it for us? Yeah, I'm going to repeat repeat the question. So, correct me if I, I get get it wrong, but I think the first question was, will we really reach a day where, for all the transactions in our lives, we can really leave the wallet with the cash at home, uh, even for things like tipping? Um, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'd be surprised if the answer is no. It's more a question of when. But um, do you guys want to each take that one, and then we'll get to the second part? I would obviously hope so, because for our business, <laughs> no, it's a very no, nice no, thing no. to, the, this cash component is actually the biggest competitor we have, but looking at my parents, I don't see that happen, that my mother lets, get, lets go of cash, and also for my generation, I'm not so sure. Um, I'm pretty sure the 15-year-olds today, they can live in a world without cash. Um, Technology-wise, I don't even think that's the problem. I think it's very easy to build stuff that once consumers adapted to the no-cash world, um, can solve those problems. So the answer, his answer, which is fascinating, is yes, not in our lifetime, not because the technology won't be there. We're the problem, so we all have to, those of us that are uh, of a certain age, we all have to kind of move on, and the generation that never thought of it, you know, I often think, uh, we have a one-year-old son, and I often think the notion of writing a check is going to seem so antiquated. The idea that we wrote our name on a piece of paper and that was how we paid for things is going to seem as quaint as the fact that we used to cram into a little booth to make a phone call. What do you think, Peter? Uh, cash is dirty, but it provides freedom. So, uh, of course, a society without trucks, without black money, without prostitution sound interesting. <laughs> but what is this a life? So if there's a control about everything. So I'm afraid there will be maybe a future where there is no cash and there's the absolute control by managing big, big data. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I'm not sure, and this is a more philosophical question, if a society really wish to have full control. So another great answer that we could have that society, but do we really want it? Uh, what does it mean to lose anonymity? And I think the whole idea of Bitcoin, and you all are very uh, sanguine on the prospects that it'll actually be able to uh, achieve its goal of anonymous and unregulated, but I think the idea of Bitcoin is to provide sort of that anonymous way in a digital world, which, as you point out, just might not be possible. What do you think in terms of cashless? Um, so there, there are first countries which have a clear strategy to get cashless. Uh, so, for example, Sweden is working towards that. Um, I think, of course, uh, looking right from Germany perspective, I would say we are years behind because we have, simply have a different approach to cash. Um, I would not uh, look at uh, that we completely get rid of cash. I think there will always be some form of cash. Um, the question is, will we get to something like, uh, I don't know, 95, 96 percent? Uh, I would expect yes. Um, question is when? I don't know. If I look back, um, I don't know, t uh, 30 years ago uh, with the introduction of ATMs, even uh, 30 years ago is even a, a long time, there were no ATMs, um, so more or less everything was running through cash. We now have a situation where people are more and more using cards. Um, and to be honest, I would love it because the most stupid thing is to walk to an ATM to withdraw cash, bring it to the merchant, which brings it back to the bank. <laughs> this is stupid. 
in the end. Um, so there's a lot of efficiency which is lost. Um, and I live on the countryside of Munich, and uh, finding an ATM is already a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holger. Yeah, I, I, I kind of uh, you know, picking up on your point, uh, I believe it's going to be very different in different areas of the world, right? You have Scandinavia, where you basically are cashless already. Um, and then uh, also, if you're in your neck of the woods, um, you know, you leapfrog already because there was no, the banking infrastructure has not been as uh, advanced. Um, like in the, what, what we call the developed countries. Uh, so, you know, countries leapfrog, specifically in Africa already, Kenya everything goes through the example. phone. And, and create a real economy, basically, on, on, on cashless society. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm afraid, uh, I agree that, um, you know, our area here, uh, developed countries, specifically Germany, you know, went through two wars and deflation and all these kind of things. Um, we collectively will be hung up on, on, on cash all the time, and, and I think we can diminish um, the the amount, but but it's probably not gonna not get not get rid of it because there's still again this freedom or the the sense of freedom. Um, you know, is still there. Right? So the second part of this question, I think it, it is also a good question, is how much of where we want to get can be solved, if I'm paraphrasing right, how much of this can be solved through evolutionary technology, and how much do we need revolutionary technologies in the, in the payments world? And, you know, it seems like, you know, there's the old saying of, you know, some people talk about the future and other people sort of, you know, get their way uh, by, you know, just incrementing on the future. And, um, what do you guys think in terms of, and obviously you each come to this with a business model that's more or less evolutionary versus revolutionary, but I'm interested in different thoughts. I mean, I think one, one big revolution is already to get rid of the card and pay with something different, whether that's with a QR code, with your face, with NFC, with your phone. That's one revolutionary step, I would say. But afterwards, all, all there is, you have to make connection between the merchant account and the end customer account, and by which means doesn't really matter. Must be an evolution because you need to change consumer behavior. But important step in the future will be governmental support, like in Sweden, that there is a decision that public transport is just uh, able to be paid by cards. So this is something what will happen in the future, especially in Europe, based on black money and that the governments needs to get more taxes. <laughs> Um, I also see it don't, not as in a technology issue, we have the technology. Um, if it's NFC, if it's Bluetooth, low energy, um, but the game is not about technology, it's about the use case. Um, and in the end, creating use cases, creating processes, uh, like my taxi, like Starbucks, um, and the other approaches, which people simply take up, because it gives them a value add. Um, and the value add is not if exchanged in the plastic card, um, or putting the plastic card into phone without creating an ecosystem around what you have on your mobile phone already. So creating more services, buying your ticket on your phone, getting your ticket onto the phone, entering the, travel, uh, the transport system, or like Transport for London does, it just tap your phone. Mm -hmm. It's even easier. And if you create this, this is what the people will take up. But your point too, that it's not the technology, I mean, I still say it, most of the work that needs to get done is Apple and Google and telecom and Visa and my bank deciding how much, how much of the pie I'm willing to pay, figuring out the most I'm willing to pay, and then how much they're going to divide is, is probably as much of the issue, no? Well, you mentioned this before, this market is fragmented, we need to sort it out. What is the future, let me see, business models of the different partners? But I believe that all relevant parties have a sense that there is a need to partner, and so it will happen. Okay. Um, other questions? See another one there? Yes, hello. Um, yes, my question is, you all have a lot of uh, payment systems and so on, and they are all different, and you need another app to use it. There is PayPal, QR shopping, and so on. and. Wouldn't it be a better solution to integrate all those kinds of apps into one big solution so you can use it everywhere because there are a lot of little stores everywhere in every city that are very important, that have a high revenue in total, and uh, you can use the system there and this system there. And yes, do we have any plans to integrate, to communicate with, it, uh, with each other or not? So again, it's a great question. I mean, you kind of are punishing the earliest users because in order to take advantage of the most mobile payment opportunities, you have to download a million apps. I've 
you know, have five or six payment apps, if you will, on my iPhone. Is that, is that a necessary, though, place to get to what clearly would be easier, which is one or two apps? I don't know. Well, let, let me start. You guys were mentioned by name, so yeah, why don't you start? Yeah, always. Um, <laughs> um, uh, number one, we all, we, I guess we're all talking to each other, right? Uh, uh, because it's such a um, complex field to, to go into that, you know, there's communication on, on, on all levels. Uh, however, um, innovation doesn't really happen by collectivity, right? You have a few companies who changed our behavior, and there are four companies, right? It's Apple, it's Google. It's, uh, it's, it's Amazon, Amazon and uh, it's uh, Apple, Google, Amazon. Uh, these are Facebook. Uh, Facebook. These are companies who actually did change our behavior every, every, every day, right? And, and uh, the question is really how do we fit into, I don't want to say in this ecosystem, but how do we fit in the world of changing behavior? At the end of the day, the one who decides what is being used is the consumer. Um, and um, we will from our point of view, we will do everything to address that consumer in the best possible ways. We also feel that we are very well positioned because we are also globally big enough to have some critical mass. But at the end of the day, it comes down to convenience, trust, and brand name, uh, which can be you know applicable to, dif to, to different to different places. So it will take some time. And, and over time, and I'm with Peter on this, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the next 12 months, but over the next uh, two years, I think there will be some more collaboration and, and uh, you know, forming up in different forms or shapes. Uh, very hard to predict, but I, I think this is, it will have to have happened. Uh, but the key driver is really the acceptance on the consumer side. We have to see what is working, and then we will, you know, move in that direction. So kind of... Did you want to answer and then I uh, want to follow yeah, up? I, I'm just asking. The, the question for me is what do we have in your wallet today? It's not just one, it's not, not only cash and it's not only one card. So you have already used today multiple different providers for doing your payment transactions. And on the mobile phone you will of course have the same. Um, and if you take the loyalty cards on top, you probably have a bunch of cards. The mobile phone even makes it easier already in the first step by having them all on the mobile device. And the next step, of course, is then to see where have, are your frequent users, so you might use a different model. You might, for example, use approaches based on Bluetooth low, uh, low energy, or you travel abroad, then you might go, go back to a Visa and MasterCard card because you know it works worldwide. Um, so in the end, it will be combined, and it is a typical in the, that in the beginning, of course, you have multiple different innovators, which in the end will f either collaborate some will survive and some will not survive. I want to get to one of our Twitter questions. Somebody asked the panel, what app do you like the most? And I'm going to expand it. What, what form of payment is the most important to you? If you could only have one of the forms of payment, uh, what, what, what couldn't you live without? And the caveat that the questioner asks is, you can't use your own form or your own ecosystem. So, you know, what is the most uh, useful uh, payment or app that you have today? It's okay to say cash. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mean payment application? Yeah. Um, so what I'm using is a combination of uh, mobile wallet from the various different clients we are serving. So I can't ma say what I love one more than the other one. <laughs> All right, that, that was a sales pitch. No, uh, not, not your own. Um, not my own. Um, I'm not using um, any other because um, it's, it's simply the ones which we are serving. So I'm using those ones. And of course, I have my wallet with me because I need it, um, mm -hmm. but I would love to leave my wallet at home and just have my mobile device with me, like probably every man around the world, carry as much, as less as mm -hmm. possible. <laughs> does anyone on the panel, I don't want to make, put everyone on the same, does anyone have an app or a payment method that they think is kind of interesting that isn't their own that they want to give a shout out to? Okay. So I think, you know, credit cards and cash uh, are still probably, everyone's experimenting in their own business and beyond that, they're pulling out their Visa card uh, or their MasterCard or their American Express or is there any, am I leaving anyone out, Discover? Um, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, one, maybe one perspective. Um, uh, I, I just came this morning from, from Oldenburg where I spent the day yesterday and, and we just ran a six months trial in the city of Oldenburg uh, based on QR shopping. And um, for us, it was a pilot because we learned so much. We also learned a lot what doesn't work. And for instance, the whole notion of window shopping does not work. Um, but 
uh, window shopping meaning that the QR code is placed in a, in a, in a shopping window. Uh, it's because the user says, if I'm already there, I can go shopping. If the store is closed, I'm fine with that. And then I you know, convert to, to online payment. What is working, however, is that QR codes are being used for remote payments. For instance, print works very well. Direct conversion out of advertising or out of magazines works very, very well. What also is working is to reorder uh, usable goods, diapers, for instance, or eye drops, or things you already know what you, you, you buy. It's, it's uh, you know all the time. It's always the same. And when the bottle goes empty or where the package, the tea bag goes empty, you just order it and it's being delivered to you. That works very, very well. Um, on the other hand, if you go into into the store, QR codes are a little bit weird, right? Then uh, you, we we figure out that uh, the PayPal eye beacon um, or other technologies are actually working much better in a in a in a retail environment. So um, uh, you know, it's it's it is partly about technology, but it's a technology being adapted and used in the use case for what it makes sense. So we're almost out of time. I want to want to leave the audience with an answer to where do you think we'll be three to five years from now and, and what's the one key hurdle that we're going to overcome that's going to get us there? And I want to give each of you a chance. So where are we going to be three to five years from now? Well, card penetration in Germany will have risen from 30% to 40-50% and um, there will be a significant portion of mobile payments okay. in the market. Peter. Do I think the speed of implementing mobile commerce and payment will be much higher than expected. We are now after the hype in a kind of frustration period and I'm expecting seeing now the first feedback from our customers that there will be a positive surprise of the acceptance and there will be a real market and not just PowerPoint. So, you know, it's, it's tough, it's tough, it's tough and then all of a sudden it it's there. Okay. Christian. Um. Yeah, it's more or less the same thing, um, statement. Uh, what we will see is less cash. We will see um, more electronic transactions. We will see more contactless transactions, either with a card or with a mobile device. Um, predicting the figures is different because, um, or is challenging, because what I learned is always the, the, and the, the difficult factor to um, understand is the user. We all know that, and uh, Nokia knows that also <laughs> now. Um, and this is uh, why I'm not giving any prediction, boy. <laughs> All right, Holger, you get the last word. Where are we yeah, going to be I, three I, to five I, years? I, from I now? basically agree, right? I, we, we believe that you know probably a third to half of, of all payments will be, or commerce will actually come through mobile devices in general, uh, even on the couch. Um, we will indeed see uh, real value um, on the merchant as as the user side, you know, in very specific branches of, of the market, probably not in the in the, in the entire uh, uh, breadth. And what I'm also predicting is that you will actually see an, uh, an acceleration of uh, innovative startups, startups to move into this, this space um, uh, much faster than it is currently happening. Or we see an example here, but we will see that much, much more uh, because the, the, the proving point or the baseline will be there. And, and I believe that will accelerate the innovation. Great. Well, thank you so much for a great discussion. Thank you to the audience for uh, such good questions. And um, I hope we'll be back in a year or three years to uh, kind of see where we're surprised or not. Thank you all. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Good slide. Thanks. I think we'll exit this way. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we'll out this way.